Hi, everyone. Today, I have Henry Andrews with me to discuss, uh, well, Gravesian stage theory and the, the, the work of uh, Claire Graves. Um, I just in so much of the stuff that you've posted online and in various groups and forums and contexts that I've seen you discussing these things, um, you, uh, you just have a very deep knowledge of Graves's work. I'd love to ask you about, you know, how you came to that and then talk about um, both Graves' work, but also developments of, um, to situate this a little bit, right? So um, I guess to kind of take a, a huge step back in the kind of meta-modernist community, there's a lot of discussions around stage theories. Um, the work of Hansi Freinacht makes a lot of use of uh, human psychological development as part of his uh, kind of broader political program and the broader vision he's uh, articulating. And um, and that is sort of also drawing upon inspiration from the work of Ken Wilber and in integral theory in general. And of course, Ken Wilber uh, made use of spiral dynamics in articulating some of his developmental ideas for a period anyway. And spiral dynamics is sort of a, uh, a packaging and uh, presentation uh, based on the work of Claire Graves. And so there's a lot of kind of lineage stuff going on here um, and some, some controversies, uh, not the least of which has been the most recent um, pretty heady discussions that have occurred uh, that have been sort of uh, provoked by um, uh, some reflections <laughs> from Nora Bateson, the uh, warm data um, complexity theorist, I suppose you could call her, um, uh, saying stage theories are BS and colonial as hell, uh, which set off a firestorm of reactions. And, uh, and, and Henry has coined the term, the great stage theory debate. Is that what you call yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I, I titled a page that yeah. just where I was keeping links to everything. So, um, Anyway, with all that as sort of context, uh, you know, for me, stage theories have uh, have been a lot of the topic of conversation lately. Um, certainly, a, a concept uh, fraught with uh, well, let's just say they're fraught. There, there's uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on there, um, yeah. and there's a lot of nuance that could be uh, drawn out, and a lot of more refined approaches that could be taken than maybe some of the more simplistic. Uh, characterizations, etc. So, uh, who better to begin to kind of dissect some of this stuff than uh, than than Henry? Um, let's start with Claire Graves, uh, because he is sort of uh, his work and his research is sort of in some ways the genesis for all this. Um, and uh, so, if you could maybe let start there with with uh, with diving into this and, and maybe say a little bit about who Claire Graves was, what his research program was, etc. Right. So, so Grace was a professor at Union College in upstate New York, uh, and he was a professor of psychology. And he got frustrated over, you know, his students would, would ask him which of these various theories of, of human nature is correct. And it was clear that they could not all be correct um, uh, because they just contradicted each other. Um, and kind of out of that frustration, he decided to do some research and try to figure out, well, which is correct? Is it just one that's correct? Uh, it was a very open-ended approach. So it wasn't a typical scientific method. He had a hypothesized theory and set out to prove it or disprove it. Um, it, it was more like a technique that was later formalized as grounded theory, where you come up with some questions that you intend to answer and then you do a bunch of experiments and you, you, you build the theory out of what emerges from there. Um, now that wasn't a formalized process when Graves did this. It just happens that, that that's, you know. And, and, and when was Graves doing this? Like set the context. This, this was in the, uh, in the, this is around 1950 or so. He started his research in 1952, I think, uh, in the early fifties. Um, and, you know, spent the, uh, the rest of that decade doing his, his, first pass at it, um, but kept going certainly through the 60s and some into the, into the early 70s. Uh, and it was in the 60s when he started publishing uh, his, his, his work in various ways. Um, at first he had trouble finding um, sort of mainstream outlet for it. He, he gave some talks, uh, but he eventually got 
published in the Harvard Business Review as more of an applied uh, thing. So he found he found more success taking this as a as an applied thing for how how will bosses under how do bosses understand how to manage their direct reports was actually kind of a the the the, art, the first article title is deterioration of work standards. <laughs> Fascinating. That's, well, I'd love yeah. to come back to that because the, the spiral dynamics framework is such a kind of corporatized expression of these things. And I was always kind of curious if that was something that, uh, that, you know, was added or if that was in the original, but that's so anyway, that's, that's interesting to know. Yeah, it was, it was to some degree in the original, it wasn't the original point, um, but it was kind of the, the early application that Graves saw and that several other people before spiral dynamics even picked up on. There were a couple of other people who wrote you know, business consulting books uh, based on that. Um, but uh, so yeah, so he did this, he did this research, he asked his, basically what he did is he took his, his normal psychology, basically an intro psychology class. Uh, and he had his regular day students who were, you know, young men. Uh, and but he also taught a class at the nursing school. So he um, would manage to get some data from women that way. He also taught night school classes. So he got some data from people who, you know, were working and were not the sort of typical college student type of person. Um, and he had them write essays about what is their, what is their conception of a mature human being? Like, a, like, a, like the, what is the, what is the right way for a mature human to be? Um, and he got, you know, so he got his essays and then he would recruit different people each semester. And he would hand them a pile of essays and he would say, classify this, these, however you want to classify them. Um, you all have to agree on the classification. Anything that you can't agree on just goes in the unclassified pile. And he did this every semester for over a decade um, before he did, he did any result collation out of it. And then he kept doing it. And he'd give them the whole stack uh, every time. So like, like the second semester people got the whole year and then the second year people got the first year and the second year and it was cumulative. And uh, much to his surprise, they always classified things the same way. Well, wait, let me stop you there. Who were, who were the people he was giving these to? Were these like uh, TAs or, or just? No, I, I, I mean, maybe some, but like the, the idea was to, he was using his normal psychology class, the intro class, because it, he wanted to ask people who weren't particularly sophisticated about psychology. Great, he starts with the intro classes and then he does it a second time in the, he does this, he gets the essays three times in the class once up front, once after they kind of trade notes and try to convince each other of their positions, and then the third time after they actually re you know, read the literature of the time and you know, see what the authorities have to say. Um, did, I, did I answer your question or was there another part to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just asking sort of, trying to get a sense of who he's handing these materials to because um, mm. methodologically- Yeah, that, the judges. That, yeah, that would be sort of a, a question. He didn't, uh, you know, in his writings, he didn't mention anything about the judges specifically. Um, I, the impression that I got is that they were actually also not psychology experts, that he, you know, just grabbed some friends um, or people from other departments or, or whatever. Um, and he tried to make sure that they had no idea what, he didn't tell anybody what he was doing. Um, you know, and this is, this is one of the critiques of Graves is that people look at all this research and like, well, this is great, but it was just him. Yeah, um, like later on, he had like one grad student who did a little bit of work, um, but it was mostly just him. Um, uh, so, All right. so, yeah, I think he gave it to everyday people. And, um, and so he's life. trying to classify or t uh, find certain typological organizations for the different answers uh, that he was presented in these essays for for human values and 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 mature ad, uh, adult personality is that more or less it or it's more I mean it's more or less it he I mean it, he really left it very open and having just taken Nora Bateson's warm data post training um, which is all which is it's a very open ended non prescriptive get out of the way of the emergent complexity. It's, it's funny now, speaking of this, I'm looking back and being like, oh, actually, at, at this stage of the research, at least, Graves was very much getting away from being prescriptive. Like, he had that very vague direction, and he said, like, his students were nervous about, like, oh, my God, how do I get this right? And he, he gave them some things of, like, I'm going to grade you based on whether you tried, basically, you know. Um, uh, and and he, he did not give any real instructions to the, to the judges other than classify these somehow. 
Okay. Uh, and so what 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 were the results? The, the results basically um, more than half of the of the of the of the essays tended to be classified in the in what became the Gradian levels. Um, there were five of them, which are the ones that are now in Spiral Dynamics. Um, well, the, the first ones that showed up in, are the ones that are in Spiral Dynamics. They're um, uh, blue, orange, green, and yellow. And then red showed up when he started bringing in more people. Uh, it had been there, but there just weren't enough people in red to, um, to show up. And then late on in the process, turquoise showed up when a couple of the people who had shown up as yellow shifted their opinion and had a new thing and he was like what the hell is this you know because the yellow was like maslow's self-actualized mm -hmm. people as far he started out from maslow actually it was one of his kind of base he knew maslow they talked uh he presented one of maslow's papers when maslow was sick you know so they're they were actually friends um uh so he was like how could there be something after self-actualization so that kind of threw all of his 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 process into doubt. And this happened a lot of times. Like he didn't expect the, the classification to be stable because normally if you give this really free form thing to different people, they're gonna classify it differently. Um, I've, I've done this kind of experiment like for user experience design where you, you're trying to you know, organize a store layout and you tell people to classify the products and they come up with totally different classifications for things. Like there's barely overlap. So the fact that this kept coming out the same set of classifications and the same mm -hmm. characteristics, some of them were like kind of splitting the difference between two adjacent ones, um, but uh, but they were recognizably those two, um, you know, a little more of this one or a little more of that one, right? Uh, and that's where the exiting and entering criteria came from. So that really surprised him. He and he he like was trying to figure out did my judges talk to each other, you know, from different years? Like did somebody? figure out what I'm doing. And no, no, he, he couldn't find any evidence that anybody was, that there had been any leak of what was going on. Which would seem to suggest a kind of uh, uh, an exciting positive result that there, that, that, that exactly. he'd stumbled on something that was uh, actually real in some way. Yeah. 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 And so once he convinced himself of, you know, this, these were real results, then yeah, he was very, he was definitely very, uh, very excited and, and pursuing that because there was something there. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's the core story, right? There's more to it. And, you know, he, he at some point was like, well, not everybody in the world goes to college, even night school, um, you know, and he started researching anthropology. Um, and that's where he came up with what in spiral dynamics are beige and purple, the, 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 uh, the first two um, stages. So then, uh, yeah. All right. So then, I mean, if you feel like, I feel like that does a good job sort of laying the groundwork. So then I feel like, uh, stage two of this story, if you'll pardon the pun, is sort of then the spiral dynamics, um, the way that his research then is sort of uh, packaged into the spiral dynamics framework. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Don Beck, who was a professor at um, University of North Texas, I think I had a slightly different name at the time, uh, ran across an article by Graves in a magazine called The Futurist. And this was, this was, he did publish a actual peer reviewed um, psychology article at one point that just outlined the theory, but then the futurist was more of a pop science type of thing. Um, and Beck saw that and later Chris Cohen, who was a lecturer uh, at that same school, saw it and they and Beck contacted Graves and um, in the mid seventies and uh, basically convinced him to collaborate because by that point Graves had, and this is why Graves Graves' book was not published in his lifetime. Uh, he suffered some sort of brain injury during a surgery um, and he could no longer quite focus or, or see things as well. Um, so he abandoned his manuscript in the mid seventies and was like, well, I did as much as I could and like, I can't do anything now. I'm just giving up on it. So, so Beck convinced him not to totally give up on it um, and to work with him and with Chris Cohen on, on popularizing this. Uh, and Beck went to South Africa a bunch of times to apply this and, and you know, he wrote his own little book on that. Uh, Cohen did some application in North America, I believe. Um, there's not as much detail that I found on that. Uh, the color coding emerged depending on whose story you believe, either in South Africa because it was a way to get people to think other than black and white terms because this was of course all about apartheid and race. So we wanted people to be thinking in different labels 
or well, wait, say, uh, explain that more a little bit first when you say it's all about apartheid and race. I mean, like, so what, what Beck was doing was going right. He was going during the 1980s. Um, and this is when things were building towards the end of apartheid and into the early 90s. Uh, so he was the whole story of spiral dynamics and gray is in particular like it's 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 a bit frustrating because all the things happen behind the scenes so if you go try to find like independent confirmation of like did this really cool sounding thing happen it's like well no you can't prove that it happened other than the the people involved say that it did but you can't yeah. also prove that it didn't happen mm -hmm. um so so this is part of why some people see spiral dynamics as kind of culty because like you, you dig and you dig and I've done this because I, I did a lot of work on the Wikipedia articles for this stuff and like it's hard to come up with something that is not Don Beck telling his own story. Um, and that's all well and good for the story illustrating the point of spiral dynamics and that he's like well I wanted to get the, you know, the people working in these uh, I, I don't know he did work with various corporate things and and or there was something about mine workers in mines. Sure. Um, so try, and, and trying to apply all this in like real world practical settings for for right. the benefit. He had of this. He had he drew out this diagram somewhere of um of basically like the political factions and kind of laid them out as to which different stages were more important to them and there, there were some combinations and whatnot um, and why it wasn't just as simple as a well there's the pro apartheid and anti apartheid um, there are different people with different different concerns and different values that they were trying to preserve. Um, so that was what was going on, on in, in South Africa. And that kind of is where a lot of the spiral dynamic stuff got honed. And the, the spiral dynamics adds some more detail about the change process. That was always a part of Gray's theory. He has these six conditions for change, which everybody pays attention to the, to the stages. Honestly, the mechanism of moving from stage to stage is more important than the actual stages in my mm -hmm. view. And I think and grazes as well. Um, uh, for him, it was the emergent and cyclical process that was key. And then the levels are just things that kind of, that's what happened from that process. Yeah. So to get back to spiral dynamics, this is the sort of trial by fire of that. And from all of those experiences that Beck had in South Africa and that Cohen had in the, in the US, they, um, you know, they kept going after Graves died in I think 1986. Um, and they kept going with their work and they eventually published the Spiral Dynamics book in um, 1996. Um, Grace died in 85, I don't know, mid 80s. Um, so yeah, they published that in 96 and it was published very much as a corporate leadership change management um, book uh, because that was, the, that was the market that they could find. Um, right. And you know they they made the spiral, which is this really colorful. It looks great on the cover of the book. It's a great marketing thing. You know, I'm, I'm well. That's not uh, that's debatable whether or not it looks great. But <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Know. I mean, it, 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 yeah. It's but certainly it's uh, the spiral things. Yes. No. It's it, it has a, a certain aesthetic. Let's, yes, yeah. it has a certain aesthetic. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, I, I won't necessarily praise that particular rendition of it, but. Um, but it definitely, you know, it is things like colorful spirals are attention grabbers and it's like, okay, yeah, what's this going on? It, it, it's got a sense of motion to it. Um, it. You know, as as logos go, you could do a lot worse. Um, so that with the colors and the color coding made it easy to remember, you know, Grace identified with letter pairs. So it's A-N, B-O, C-P, and then you get to A prime, N prime, B prime. It's like, it took right. me a while to remember those. Right. So, so as I interpret it, it's sort of like Graves does the initial research um, and there can be some methodological critiques there, some, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. but, but that's basically, you know, what he contributes and, and sort of lays the groundwork for this. Beck and Cohen come in, uh, contact him, work with him for a while, and then also sort of posthumously after he dies, um, bring it all together and publish this work, which is highly marketed to sort of a particular, um, well, demographic of a, you know, it, it presented in a, in a, in, with a, with an emphasis on sort of its utilitarian applications yeah. and, um, and particularly sort of within this realm of kind of corporate America, understand your, your, your company and its inner workings and the different sorts of people and perspectives that are working uh, with you and that sort of a thing. And it sounds like, and I didn't know this, but sort of, 
picking up from that thread that Graves himself had kind of tapped into with uh, with his with his first article and that. So um, how does this kind of uh, then get picked up by the integral theory folks? Yeah, so um, Wilbur was aware of Graves. He mentioned Graves, at least in passing, in one of his books in the 80s or 90s. It got mentioned, at least in passing, in Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, I, I think, uh, as well, a bit later. Um, but yeah, once the Spiral Dynamics book started, came out, Wilbur got wind of that. Um, Beck developed an interest in Integral. I don't know exactly how that started. Um, they started corresponding. Um, so Wilbur first really pulled in Spiral Dynamics in um, Integral Psychology, which first appeared in, I think, 99 in the back of uh, one of his collected works. Like I collected the work and then he published the work later. I, it's a little unusual. Um, so <laughs> Integral Spirituality was published standalone the next year. Uh, but before that, A Theory of Everything was published and that also really, really brought in Spiral dynamics, and that is where the whole chapter on the mean green meme and boomeritis came in, and I can rant on that forever. Um, and, and but then this also then gets kind of almost formally merged with SDI, like the spiral yeah, dynamics so, integral. So so back in back in Wilbur, we're definitely starting to collaborate. Um, Cohen did not approve of Wilbur uh, and an integral, uh, and Beck did not approve of Natasha Todorovic and Todorovic, I might be emphasizing that wrong. Um, but anyway, so yeah, they were not, the, so there was an acrimonious split around 98 or 99. Um, and Beck started collaborating more with Wilbur. Uh, and, you know, it's worth noting that if you read those footnotes in the, the infamous Wilbur footnotes in, uh, in A Theory of Everything, he's already criticizing some things about Beck's mm -hmm. approach to dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's never been entirely clear to me how thoroughly aligned they were. I mean, they were both referencing each other, but I'm not sure they, you know, it was, there was only a period of like two years where they were, were totally, at least in theory together. And like in 2002, Beck published like on New Year's Day, this like, and now it's Spiral Dynamics Integral. And that's where the SDI came from. Um, but pretty soon after that, they started diverging uh, with Wilbur's emphasis on spirituality and, and uh, the latter approach uh, and, and the integration of it with other things, whereas Beck was... Well, let me ask you this. Um, just as a side note, I'm just curious. I mean, in your read of all this, and I guess in the grand scheme, it doesn't really matter because the, all these things is just sort of a kind of interpersonal gossip side of all this story. But I do think it's intriguing. Um, I mean, do you, the sense that I do get from Beck and Cowan is that they are trying to market this to a particular kind of audience and they're sort of opportunistic in trying to do that. Do you see the kind of rebrand of SDI as being part of that of sort of, oh, this integral thing's taking off and Wilbur's on board, like, let's let's capitalize on this? Or is that yeah. an uncharitable reading? I, no, I mean, I think, I think it's a fair reading and I think it's a totally reasonable thing. Like, I think, uh, you know, and, and Beck has talked about Wilbur bringing it to more people, you know, both as a positive thing and that that's something that he kind of owes Wilbur for, but also... You know, from what I have read, there's, you know, there's, there's a bit of bitterness there in terms of like Wilbur took this and, and a lot of more people know about spiral dynamics from Wilbur than they hear from Beck. And that's, that's their uh, side of things. Whereas Cohen was more like, okay, I'm going to go over here and we're going to kind of tightly control what we're doing here. Um, cause like he and Natasha, apparently from, from what I've heard from people who trained with him, like had some regrets about how that stuff got out. They were particularly against the mean green meme concept and they, they wrote a paper refuting all of that and like with some numbers and research and stuff. Um, and, and saw how the, um, you know, what they refer to as paintballing, people just you know, assigning colors to people and how damaging that was. Yeah. So in some ways, I think they kind of prefigured a little bit of, of Nora's critique, although of course they preserved the theory. Um, but their, their response was to kind of pull it in and like, you really have to go to them and take their their yeah. classes and right. that's not put out there. Right. Beck is kind of in the middle, like he offers the training, but he licenses other people to do the training. It's much more accessible. You can find a lot more of his writing. So, all right. Hey, thank you. That's a really great, helpful summary of 
Graves work, spiral dynamics, et cetera, and how this gets implemented with integral. So then now um, I feel like maybe just to put a little bow on that, it seems like integral has a brief sort of, uh, you know, surge of interest and kind of popular awareness. Everyone's reading and then slowly that kind of peters out a little bit. And then by kind of the late 2000 or, or you know, uh, like 2008, 2009, 2010, et cetera, like a lot of that energy sort of dissipated a little bit and, um, and, and sort of, yeah, we're in different kind of zone. Um, that wave is crested. Um, and then of course, I would argue there's sort of been a new kind of uptick in a lot of this with um, metamodernist conversations um, and reimaginations and reappropriations and applications of uh, developmental theory. But I also think that I don't want to also, I'm not trying to not give the integral community its credit too. I think it's been a, a, a continual force. It seems like that's sort of there and, and maybe um, anyway, we can, we can come back to that. My point though, or where I'd like to kind of go with this, I'd also love to hear about how this can be thought of within the context of the broader uh, stage theory debate. Yeah. Um, so why don't we start there um, with the stage theory debate? Because now that um, there's been this sort of, um, and I don't want to, I'm probably filtering this too much through my own lens um, because for me, it seems like, oh, wow, developmental theory is really taking off. And, and that could just be because I am yeah. increasingly exploring developmental theory. Um, so I don't want to make that mistake too much, but it does seem to be that there is um, a, a certain new kind of revitalized interest in this material. Um, yeah. Would you agree with that? Actually, maybe I'll just pose that as a question first. Is that true or am I imagining something? I, I mean, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, I was super excited to discover Hanzi's work um, because I had, I mean, I have a I have a complex relationship with integral theory, right? I, I think that there's been a lot of interesting stuff there. I, there's also a lot of things that, I mean, some of the things that Wilbur has done and said, I kind of cringe over. And then some things I'm just like, well, that's not really my, my aesthetic. It's not really my focus. Well, so, so yeah. So going through all that, um, I kept, I kept getting the feeling of like, okay, there's stuff here, but like, ah, there's all these like anti-green um, people, you know, who just demonize it. And that goes with all the anti-postmodernism type of stuff that's going on, you know, and then there's, there's, there's the question of like, okay, are you post postmodernism or are you just anti postmodernism? And a lot of people who want to think they're post postmodernism right. are actually reactionaries. Sure. Um, but uh, but I was like, no, there's something here. There's really something here. Like this data, yeah, there are very various ways you can criticize Graves for not having a globally broad enough sample of people for not doing this, that, or the other thing in terms of methodology. But something emerged there, like it's a pretty understandable process and something emerged there. And I've done enough classifications yeah. work to be like, okay, if everybody classifies it the same thing, that's a thing. So then let's dive into this then. Cause I, all right. Taking all of that as background context for this, right. Uh, then, then Nora Bateson um, with uh, with more or less a tweet kind of sends uh, these various <laughs> communities who are, who, who uh, are invested in this material for I think a lot of the reasons that you're talking about, it's uh, it's a way of making sense of the world, right? I mean, ma using it for pragmatic, utilitarian, business-oriented reasons is just one slice of how it might be used and may maybe was the most marketable at the time. But clearly it's taken on a whole life mm -hmm. of its own um, from people who, wow, once you discover this developmental framework, something clicks about the way that you look at the world and that you understand human interactions and different groups and different, you know, dynamics. And you're like, oh, of course, like now this kind of makes sense. Right. So, so then my question is, right. Um, so Nora comes out and she says, you know, stage theories are BS and colonial as hell. And as I say, this, this begins a sort of firestorm um, and without kind of getting into, again, when getting to ad hominem about the ways that people might've reacted to that and all that stuff. Um, I'm curious about the way that you reacted. Cause I feel like as someone who, as you say, is, you know, you're, is invested in this in the, in the sense that you think it's, it's, it's saying something about reality and that it's useful. Yeah. Um, but you've also been 
um, how would I say it? You've been very charitable uh, and very open to the idea that, uh, to her critiques and to, to all of that. So I, I'd like to know, I guess, just how, how all this kind of pans out for you, right? I mean, how, how, how yeah. is it that you can say, yes, this, this has some deep core truth to it. And somehow I can also give some space to the idea that stage theories are BS because those seem to be mutually yeah. exclusive ideas. And so I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to what some of those specific critiques are, how they're valid versus how they're not, or anyway, any, any way you want to go about, you know, tackling that one. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I found myself in a very interesting position in that debate kind of being the only not the only both and, but probably the most emphatically both and uh, uh, person who kept going back and going back. You know, there were people who would drop in and say something, but, um, uh, and it was funny because I was kind of at some point complaining like, why don't more people want to do this thing? Like try to figure out how this could be revised and, and incorporate the critique. And I was like, I think that person is you. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, right, <laughs> I guess so. Um, so the reason that I the reason that I ended up in that space, I think, is that you know about two years ago, um, I had you know when I got Never Ending Quest, and I was feeling that like there's something here, but I also like the Spiral Dynamics thing that I'm not the target market. That doesn't really, sure that's fine, but but that's not my thing. Um, and I I start what well, I wanted to read I wanted to come up with a new diagram instead of the spiral or the kind of little interacting wave thing that you get from Graves. Um, it's not important if you don't know what I'm hand waving there. Uh, I, I just want to come up with some way that I thought highlighted the patterns of of what goes on. So like the fact that things switch back and forth between individual oriented and kind of collective oriented or inward locus of control, outward locus of control, you know, you can, you can frame that endless number of ways. Uh, and another friend of mine, um, Kylie had, had pointed to, to me that there was an every third pattern, right? Uh, and we were talking about red and green, both being in some ways kind of destructive, uh, right? Like, tearing down whether that's like the emotional, like I'm gonna tear down the tradition and do my own thing of red or the deconstructive, uh, I, you know, all of these things that you have built are causing harm. I'm going to pull them back apart until we can rebuild something better. So like they're, they're both kind of destructive in that sense. Uh, and we came up with something for the other two, for, 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 for two other um, uh, pairs uh, like that, but I, I don't remember exactly what they were. Um, so I was like, there's, there's stuff here, this whole six cycle of the tears. I hate how so much of integral in particular, um, but also a fair amount of spiral dynamics in general, um, has the second tierism and right. like, if only we're all second tier, everything will be wonderful and we will right. ascend to the whatever. And, or, oh, that I, you're a first year thinker. You're not, you know, you're not one of the enlightened ones. So First of all, that's why I agreed with Nora's critique to a large degree, because I had, I see that all the time. I see that harmful pigeonholing of people under a color. I see that dismissing a particular color slash stage. Um, I see, you know, I mean, Ken Wilber demonizes green and exalts turquoise. Like it's, it's not subtle. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's not subtle at all. Uh, and, and that bothers me a lot. Um, uh, but but let me ask you this though. So like, one of the things that I found so hard about the kind of premises of the debate is that it's so binary, so kind of simplistically yeah. dichotomous, right? And not even just like, not even just at the level of this is wrong, uh, like in yeah. the fact, sense of factually wrong, but actually this is like almost evil or a kind of morally important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So there's, it, there's a kind of double-edged element to that. And um, so what I've Oops. been, what I've been struggling with in trying to achieve that sort of both and engagement here is that, um, you know, everything that you're saying is, is like, okay, Yes, these these things. There's a reality to this whole thing. People have misused this system. It's not a perfect system. It's not mm -hmm. fully been uh, effectively theorized. There's some deepening that could happen, and all these, you know, and like a hundred percent, right? That's I completely agree with that. 
But when you say that stage theories in general are wrong or bullshit and that they <laughs> are, are colonialist, um, then I feel like that's sort of a different level of argument, right? And so I guess I, I'm not sure if it's just, um, you know, I'm not sure what it is, like being able to filter out like, ah, well, maybe it's not meant as extremely as it's presented or maybe you're you're being charitable and saying well yes it's been supplied so but you know what i mean like it, it's almost like um yeah. it's like uh if someone said like it's the difference between someone saying um you know like looking at say social programs and saying you know yeah they're not working correctly right and they're not they're not really actually helping people in the way that would be optimal etc and there's a lot of waste etc and then someone just comes out and says social programs are a joke, you know, it's sort of like, right. well, okay. Yeah. In some ways, but also like if you're, if you're going at the very, you know, heart of the idea, it's, it's for me, one is one's more about how do we reform these to make them mm, more yeah. effective and more accurate versus, versus just going at sort of the basic idea and negating it. And therefore, you know, and, and to be honest for myself, I just see, I see Nora's project as being much more the latter, much more, you know, the whole thing is rotten and we can't be looking at these stages and giving them any sense of credence. So um, that's, what's been a little bit hard for me, but I'd be curious uh, what you think about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, and, and, and if you watch one of the, uh, I think the video that Jeremy uh, moderated, uh, Jeremy Johnson moderated, um, you'll, you'll see her talk about this directly. Like some of that comes from her whole family history with regards to eugenics and the ways in which there are similarities there, or in some cases, direct ties um, with early stage theory, people being basically pro eugenics. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that there's definitely, uh, uh, yeah, there's definitely a charge to the topic there in the context of her work and her, her you know, her father's work and her grandfather's work, like it's a multi-generational thing there. Um, you know, and I also think that some of this is just the difficulty of communicating on, you know, through a, through a Facebook post with 2,000 comments on it or whatever. Like, I think, I think Nora just is, is focused on, first of all, some of what she was talking about was more about like Piaget. And there it is a very step ladder, like from age X to Y, you are in stage blah, and then you should be in here, and then you should be in here, and then you should be in here. And it's very prescriptive. And in fact, there has been research that shows that like, actually, yeah, that's not really quite how things work. And there are a number of ways that that was flawed. So I think in the sense of, if you look at that kind of like original Piaget style work, um, there is a very solid critique of, of that's fatally flawed and it is so prescriptive that it is in fact damaging to people who now then think that their child is failing at development or whatever and then they're going to put you through this whatever thing to catch you up and like so so I like in that sense I see the 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 evil aspect of it and then when you get to graves and spiral dynamics part of it is that like it's a complex theory it's not a mutually exclusive ladder. You are actually operating at all the levels all the time at different combinations and it changes depending on your context and during the day. Um, and I think in that sense, there's a lot more about Grace's work that is potentially more in alignment with where the critique is going. But when you do put these labels of the, of the colors on there, then it gets reduced really fast to sure. labels. And, and that's, that's where, you know, at one point in the discussion between Nora and John, she's like, why don't you just do the theory, but without the labels? And hmm. I was like, that's, that's an interesting, like, what would that look like? Well, um, it certainly make it harder to, to, to discuss it, right? If we yeah. can't use words to, uh, you know, I mean, this is, I, I talked to her a little bit about this and it's like, I mean, every scientist, right, makes abstractions based on particulars in yeah. order to be able to speak about classes or groups that more effectively can can talk about higher uh, level order mechanisms, et cetera. Um, and uh, it seems sort of inevitable, and not only inevitable, but actually intrinsic to the very yeah. to, to the very uh, project of scientific endeavor of being able to say, "Here's a bunch of particular things. How do we?" 
best simplify this into an elegant system that can that can be highly uh, productive in an explanatory fashion. Um, I, and I don't want to make this too much about Noir because to be perfectly honest, I think it gives it, how do I say this in a way that um, I can stand behind? I think Noir is brilliant. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Um, and obviously, well, two things. I think she's brilliant, but I, I also, I just, on this issue, I don't know why we, like people particularly care what she has to say about it in that it, maybe that's a bit too strong. It's sort of like, yes, you are a brilliant complexity scientist. Um, uh, but what sort of background do you have in developmental theorizing and the research of, you know, these sorts of stage series themselves yeah. other than, so they're like, that's always been a question for I me. And I've posed that to people and it hasn't always landed. Um, beyond that, I also think that it, it's it's actually kind of troubling to me where there's this sort of like, well, you know that her father was, you know, Gregory Bateson. It's like, right, yeah, right. of course. But like, why should that matter? Like, what, what? Like, you know, what are we like? Do we live in the medieval feudal era of like, uh, you know, lineages and things like that? It's like, no, I mean, she she has a great body of work that she's done that she can stand on that is doing really good stuff. It's just sort of like. You know, I just I've never fully understood yeah. why Nora Bateson's critique was so compelling to people in this space. And um, I'll probably get a lot of flack for saying that. But I mean, I'm happy to have that conversation. I can I could be totally wrong about it. Maybe she does have some developmental theory background. But I don't know. I mean, so that's a bunch of thoughts. There. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, yeah no, people people have definitely brought this up. Um, and, you know, I. I think I heard of Nora before I heard of Barry Bateson or William Bateson. So, you know, to me, it wasn't so much, oh, she's the daughter of uh, Gregory. It was like, she's this interesting person doing this cool, warm data right. stuff. Yeah. It's really interesting. Oh, and her father was so-and-so. Cool. Yeah. Um, so to, to me, I think the connection here is, um, is in the idea of how to affect change. Right, because you know one of the, the things with the warm data lab is you you bring in a bunch of people and you facilitate these emergent conversations, um, and and it's 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 the opposite of prescriptive. It's so open. It's so like you're not even going in and being like, all right, we're going to talk about this thing to solve this problem. Like, here's here's the topic, go. It's like, no, it's like, you are the people that are relevant, maybe some people who aren't relevant, just to keep some, some more perspectives in here, and you're in a room, and we're going to kind of talk about stuff in general, and, and, and something might emerge that will address some problem, which is probably more important than whatever surface problem you thought you were coming in here to talk about. Mm -hmm. So like that's, that is at least an application of warm data. So that is about like taking a, you know, some sort of social context and, and looking at, at, at where to go. Uh, and Spiral Dynamics is coming in with a, we will do this by coming in and we will give you all assessments and we will assess you and we will talk with you about your assessments. And based on our assessments, we will tell the boss what to do. And like, if you actually go in and read some of the good you know, certified spiral dynamics practitioners sites, they have, have a lot of stuff in there about how much it's important to, to have conversations with people and not just hand out yeah. assessment. But, but, but again, if I may though, like, uh, th this is for me, like I make a, I make a distinction between the application, right. And the science, mm -hmm. like, um, uh, for me, the science seems, uh, I don't know what to say. It's sort of like, it's undeniable at this point. There have been so many researchers exploring certain kinds of developmental uh, um, fields, what have you. Um, and they all have come to such similar results to the degree. And I do think that Wilbur's work here is really fascinating in integral psychology that, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of fudging and some imprecision, let's say. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, to be able to say that there's a developmental space that it, that exists that is sort of uh, that correlates so many different issues between notions of self, notions of morality, notions of cognition, notions of faith, notions of you know all, ego development, all these different things, right? And um, that again, there's sort of like to get back to that notion. And then of course, Graves is kind of fits right in there <laughs> yeah. to use the language yeah. from the big Lebowski. Um, it's sort of like, yeah, okay. So like something is going on to use your words there. So 
I don't feel like we need to negate that, right? In order to then critique all the myriad ways that this can be misused. And I know that a lot of the times, um, you know, the issue of evolution comes up in these conversations because mm. I think it, it is a, a very helpful analog, right? I mean, when evolution was sort of a new theory on the scene, you had all these people applying it in disastrous and yes, you know, uh, ways that were, that led to eugenics and social Darwinism and, and all this sort of, you know, cultural jingoism and all this nonsense, right? I mean, yes, the history is clear for people who want to read it, um, I don't think that the debate is sort of, you know, there. No one's saying, yes, people can't misapply and misuse theories of science or research findings that seem to be presenting compelling models for understanding the world. Um, right, right. So that's just my, that would be my critique of the critique is that it's like, um, you know, yes, by all means. I mean, uh, as I've been getting more and more involved in these communities, mm -hmm. I see it more and more. Right. Just the paintballing. It's a great term. Yeah. All the oversimplification, the, the and it does actually lead to to uh, well, I shouldn't say lead to some people use it in an over oversimplified manner uh, to basically uh, defend notions of uh, cultural superiority or yeah. to uh, denigrate, you know, various other communities or whatever. I see all that. And it's totally true. And like, let's critique that. But I don't think we need to go so far as to say the science is bunk in order to do that. That's where I feel like it's overstated the case. I mean, first of all, it's really important to, to remember that Nora did not post that to kick off a thing. She was doing some yeah. casual venting of something that she thought would be totally true, not true. significantly controversial. <laughs> so it wasn't like I have a critique of stage theories because I know stage theory psychology. It's like, I was pissed off one day and I posted something on the internet and it exploded. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, what's your credentials for this? It's like, uh, she was on the internet and people got pissed off. I right? like, 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 it's not like she walked up to the, to the microphone and was like, you're the developmental theorist hear me now. No, that's so, a good, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, it's so easy to miss, you know, in, in the internet context of these conversations and you brought this up earlier, you know, it is so it can feel that way, right? All of a sudden yeah. you get on your computer and you see someone saying like something that's like, well, wait, that's not true. And like, well, well you know, but, and it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so it, I, I think that that is a very, a very important thing to keep in mind that it's sort of a, it's a, we need to keep in mind the media landscape in which these things are unfolding and these debates are happening. Um, yeah, and posting that doesn't mean that she claims ex, you know, certain expertise. She has right. some, but like she doesn't claim a whole bunch else just because she posts something about. No, it's a great, it's a great deal of projection, really. It seems to me, yeah. actually, it's sort of like, um, it's it's sort of like, oh, someone with great intellect and respectability has said something that has been a a a a frequent critique that has uh, been engaged or, uh, you know, uh, encountered in these communities frequently. And now it's coming up again. And it's sort of like, and now, and now it's sort of, yeah, I guess like Nora Bateson becomes the, the stand in for all right. of the, yeah, all of the ways. Every, that, everyone who's ever said yeah. <laughs> anything bad about stage theory. Right. So let me kind of, let me, let me take a step back and, and kind of, throw out my my latest meta idea of how yeah. how all this fits together and like why okay yeah there's clearly something there so why are why why did this critique catch fire when there's obviously something there yeah. and i i think that the the critique is not that there's nothing there i i i think that so I'm going to apply developmental theory to this which i can't tell us this is a good idea or not but, you know, if we look at kind of modernist or orange in spiral dynamics terms, and yes, it's also orange and integral, um, this, this is where science as we know it, you know, became a thing. This is where we got really into making models and figuring and uh, making maps of the world and figuring out how to basically how to simplify things so that we can control them. Like that is, and you know, a friend of mine who, who works in urban planning has, can talk about all sorts of different ways in which people made models of how cities should be so they can control it. And it was a really horrible idea. And like that's, you know, mm -hmm. explains so many problems with modern cities. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, there, this happens all over. This is not just a psychology thing or, or anywhere. Like it's, it's part of this, 
if this is a stage, whatever stage means, however fuzzy the boundaries, then this is this is part of it is making these models. Um, and Graves himself was very firmly planted in that context. He did not consider himself yellow or second tier or anything like that. He considers himself as high as uh, only up to like orange and like anything beyond that, that was not him. Um, so he was not a, a superior, he was not a self, you know, self-satisfied superior second tier person. Mm. Um, so I think part of this is, yeah, it has been natural for us to make models and spot these kind of patterns. And like some of my early responses to Nora were like, yeah, but the patterns are real and we have to dip blah, 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 the patterns. Um, and yeah, the patterns are real, but I, I think our way of, of, of extracting patterns from things is maybe something we should reconsider. Um, and, and I mean, honestly, one of the reasons I took the warm data course when it was offered a couple of weeks ago was because of this whole thing. And I was like, well, okay, I should understand, you know, where is, where, where did this critique come from? And having done that and looking at the fact that there, it's possible to have an effective process without modeling the situation. Um, you know, that was like, oh, okay. Huh. That's interesting because those same patterns can emerge in that process, but you haven't pre-labeled them. You haven't, you haven't precluded other patterns from emerging that you might miss, not because your patterns are wrong, but just because you're so focused on them that you miss this one over here that is just as correct and just as valuable. So, so really, you know, what I'm thinking is as we move to yellow and turquoise <laughs> or teal and turquoise, if we're going to go with the Wilbur colors, um, uh, like I think that part of the increased complexity, if we want to pull in Hanzi and the model of hierarchical complexity from commons, uh, when we get into the metasystemic or paradigmatic co complexity levels, I think part of that is letting go of the models. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and Daniel Gortz has actually, you know, when I, I was first talking with him and, and debating this death to turquoise thing. And, you know, I have a lot of problems with how people formulate turquoise, but I also think there's something there where the word turquoise gets stuck, whether it's really what people think it is or not. Um, but talking with him, his, his position was basically like, I think the theory stops being effective past here, right? Like I, you know, and this is true in other disciplines where like the theory explains up to this point, but then there are these things outside and yeah. you need a different theory for that. And I've come back at the time, I was like, I don't know about that, but I've come back to it as like, yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe, maybe we need to let go of this form of the theory because there's a better way to look at the same underlying truth. Well, let me throw this by you because the way I think about, about it is like this, like think of a, a jazz musician. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, I played jazz, well, I played the saxophone. I don't know if I could say I played jazz saxophone. I play blues saxophone, which in the stages is, is for me, yeah. I, can, I can do the blues. I, 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 I play mostly rock, you know, yeah. or, or, or long ago classical piano. So. Right. I, so I'm, I'm not claiming uh, Charlie Parker status here, but, but, right. but, but what a Charlie Parker would do, right. Is, is he'd woodshed and he would practice his scales and he would just yeah. get these down so, uh, so well that, um, and here's the point is right, right. Like when you're on stage and you're playing, you're not thinking, oh, okay, now I'm going to a sharp minor and yeah. I'm going to play this get right. You it's so embodied at that point that you can draw on all of that in a way that is just fluent. You're just fluent yeah. now in the language uh, or maybe a language would be another good example, right? You learn the language, you learn the grammar. And then eventually when you're in a conversation, you're not thinking, oh, okay, I need to, I need to, you know, uh, turn this into a pluperfect participle and right. No, you're just speaking. <laughs> right. So there, but the point is, and I have this, this has always been one of my critiques about so much that passes for postmodern art is sort of like, um, people were right. They're like, oh, wow. Like listen to Coltrane play ohm, you know, like that's what I want to do. Cause right. Like that's intense art. So why don't I just mm -hmm. jump right there? He's not playing scales, you know, why don't I just jump yeah. to the absolute? Well, you can't, right? I'm, or Picasso, yeah. right? I mean, he he went through these stages, yeah. Stravinsky, and you could look at all these great modernist artists and, and many others who just like, who were really innovating, who were really doing some really deep stuff. They had to go through these periods of like really embodying mm -hmm. that kind of more mechanical kind of the, the rote learning element so that finally they could just speak through it. And yeah. 
And I feel like that's a, for me, the analogy that I think of with these, these colors, these stages, it's like, no, if you get stuck there, if you're sort of like, oh my gosh, I was listening to this album, right? And this guy plays a C sharp when he should have played a C. It's like, well, yeah. wait a second, right? <laughs> You're like, like you're, you're so the point of that music exactly you're stuck yeah. in the scale so much that you're not able to appreciate the art and if the scale isn't serving the art then it's worthless and i think that what we're critiquing is people using these things mechanically in a way that they're not getting the, the bigger picture and and so i love the idea of them yeah, falling I, away and i don't know what you would make of that sort of way of expressing that no i think I, I think that's sorry for keep trying to get you off. I, I, you know, I think that's that's actually a great analogy, which is why I was like, oh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, like the things falling away. I love that phrase. Like, yeah, we had this this scaffolding, and it's time for the scaffolding to to fall away, be pulled away. And I think the musical one is a great thing because if we go back to like, well, why why was Nora, you know, talking about things even in terms of like, is this evil? And it's like, okay, you've got this beautiful piece of music or this beautiful live performance happening in front of you. And if you are sitting there doing nothing but analyzing the chords and the scales and mm -hmm. what did this guy do and all of that, you are not experiencing the beauty of that music. And in some sense, that is evil, right? You have, right. there's this beautiful experiential part of humanity happening around you and you have cut yourself out of it and you have turned it into this mechanical set of components and yeah, that's actually really just, you know, as a, as a musician, as yeah. a, as a fan of music and of, of improvised music, like, yeah, that's actually really disturbing. Like I have a embodied urge in that. Yeah, no, I, I, and, but, but at the same time that that's true, right. That doesn't mean that the answer, especially for a teacher an educator, someone interested in yeah. pedagogy is to say, Hey kids, don't practice your scales. Right. Right. Like that's, that's not the answer. And I, and, and I feel like, the danger of, of the, whether or not she meant this at all or, or whatever, but at least that if there's a certain kind of critique of the spiral dynamics and stage theory stuff that leads in this direction of sort of like, don't do that. It's all BS. It's sort of like saying, don't practice your scales. And I feel like that's a limitation too. Thanks. Yeah. And I think that's important. So we get back to the both and, and it's the question of how do you contextualize the theory? So particularly to, a, to be either a child or to someone who doesn't understand psychology, complexity, sociology, anthropology, all these things, how do you contextualize that for that person so that they don't just get locked into the scale? Yeah. So that they actually realize that this is a, this is a piece that you use to improvise later and that they can actually improvise from it. How do you do that? I don't think that we know that yet. Yeah, I mean, it's it. This gets into stuff which increasingly is is fascinating me, which is just questions about pedagogy, questions about being a an effective communicator, translator of material in the optimal way to meet people where they're at and to be able to 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 really help guide them in the use of the tool rather than just saying yes you know and this is you know it's like we can just mark you and say oh yes you get the the basic understanding but it's it's this is where the whole contextual component is so crucial. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what I was doing when I was talking about the cycles uh, and like wanting to re-diagram it, eventually I, I, I made that cyclical diagram that has six positions on it um, that I posted all over that, that thread from, from Nora and various other places. Uh, and we can, we can maybe do another, another session and talk about that. Uh, but the point there, and, and I had that diagram obviously before the whole debate went, was to get out of the linear and like even the spiral it's a line it's just it's just wrapped around things right you're still you're still going in a line on it um to get the get out of that linear progression um to get out of of the type of structure that was hanging people up and to provide a way you know, there's the critique of like, oh, well, well, Gravesian theory has all this complexity in it and people are just misusing it. And, and my response to that of others is like, well, okay, well, if people just keep using it, then we're not presenting it very well, right? Like if it's really, if it really has this full complexity, this flexibility that you could use it in a more warm data-ish type of way, but people aren't, then like we need to figure out how mm -hmm. to, how to highlight that. So like, how do we move this up, you know, take this out of the, the, the modernist orange model view and provide a different way of presenting it that will actually 
highlight the complexity and be non-prescriptive and support an inquiry where it can go anywhere. And knowing the things that have tended to emerge in that data uh, becomes useful, but not, not, not prescriptive. Um, so that, that's really, you know, I, I didn't have Nora's framing to describe what I was doing when I started doing it. Um, but that was a lot of what I was trying to do uh, yeah. was just get into another way to look at it uh, that would maybe contextualize it better for people who don't understand what the dangers are, who are very used to, you know, internet quizzes of, you know, what, right. what, what, um, what Harry Potter house are you or whatever, right? Here's your, here's your, your, your eight different typology, mm -hmm. you know, ratings. Uh, so, you know, like you need to, speaking of marketing, like you, you need to market to the people who are used to that. And you need to realize that they're going to jump to that. If, if it looks like that, you need to give them something that looks totally different so that they don't go there, they go somewhere else. Yeah. And that, yeah. That's what I'm trying to do, basically. Cool. No, that's really, that's helpful. And I'm, I'm super interested in this to continue that thought too, of the idea of applying developmental frameworks to the application of developmental frameworks. I'm really intrigued by the idea of say communicating. Um, it could be graves. It could be something a little bit more less specific, but sort of a develop, let's just say mm -hmm. developmental framework to really think about how, you could make that engaging at each stage. And not only that, but provide these sorts of little hooks that will get people into always kind of out of necessity needing to complexify it further so they don't get yeah. too stuck in, you know, because like you could, and I think maybe there's a lot of appeal to people in this way, right? Like you could present the developmental framework typology system uh, in a way that plays into the hands of a sort of blue or, you know, yeah. amber kind of role and identity people, thing. I think do some of that, but there is the question of like, well, what, what is the post model version of yeah. this? Right. You know, um, and, and people talk about how, oh, well, green postmodernist hate spiral dynamics because they hate all hierarchy and they hate all. And it's like, sort of, but like, there is a, there's a, the theory itself actually calls for that in the sense of, yeah, that stage actually should question those yeah. things. Yeah. And what we haven't seen in that community is, okay, well, if you accept those questions, what next? Uh, and I think that's, I think to some degree, that's why Nora touched on such a nerve among people who wanted to defend it is like, on some level, they know that this has not been moved forward, right? It, yeah. It's something that comes yeah. up a lot. It's like, since 1996, yeah, some integral stuff got merged in around like 2000, but like really spiral dynamics hasn't changed. And it, 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 it streamlined graves, but it didn't change it. Whereas I think, yeah. I think if, you, if you brought graves into, into 2021 and said, hey, we think we figured out enough about A prime in prime slash yellow slash teal that, that we think taking this model away and having this other way of looking at it would be the way to do it. I think he'd be very interested in that because he was yeah. trying to, to move forward. No. And it's interesting too. I've been so, uh, you know, Corey DeVos posted these caricatures of the integral, you know, uh, folks, and it, it, it got a lot of reaction because everyone in the community knows this, right? They knows see these it, things. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but the difference, and I thought this was really key and it's not so surprising when you say it, it's the difference when like, you know, I can talk about my family, right? And I can bitch about them and I can say, oh my God, my blank is a blank, right? right. And I can say that. But then if someone else says, hey, your blank is a blank, I'm yeah, like, hey, like, oh, screw boy. you, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I feel like what the difference was with the with the Nora great stage debate thing and like the Corey DeVos posting those was that there's an in-group, out-group dynamic, right? Yeah. When you're presented with a critique from what you deem to be the out-group, you get your defenses up and you say, well, wait a second, we need to go to ground one and be able to defend why, blah, blah, blah. If, if it's coming from, a, from someone within who, who presumably is amenable and, and, and sympathetic to the basic claims, you're not trying to defend the ideas at their core, you just, you can, yeah. then you're free to be able to say, yeah, and look at all the ways that people are crazy and stupid and silly about it. And oh my gosh, don't I even do that sometimes, et cetera. So I'd love to see these conversations move forward in a less guarded, more, um, more kind of 
And I don't know. I mean, it's unfortunate too, right? Because to even think in these terms of in-group, out-group sort of suggests that mm. it's not particularly highly evolved either in, in the framing <laughs> of these things. So, um, so the, anyway. there are stages, that is not high stage. <laughs> yeah, right. Not second tier, not second tier. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's so there's a lot there. I'd love to dig into more of this too, and and uh, I really would like to, to to have an opportunity to to explore how you are trying to articulate some of this material um, in that some of those more nuanced ways that bring bring to the foreground, you know, uh, uh, all that kind of um, yeah nuance. So thank you so much. Um, this has been really cool. I think again, you've got a really um, you know. Uh, deep grasp of all this stuff. And it's, um, it's, it, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and the, the various interventions that you're making in these sorts of conversations to bring uh, a touch of that nuance. And um, yeah, let's pick this up again uh, at some point and, uh, and continue the conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you.